just see in the background what the theme of the last leg of my journey is going to be. That little patch of blue there is the Pacific Ocean. And I'm going to go up from California to Oregon, Washington State, Alaska, and finally right in the middle of that ocean, the state of Hawaii. Its combination of architecture, situation and history makes San Francisco one of the most distinctive and beautiful cities in the world. Even the transport system is a uniquely reliable and lovable mixture of the new and the old. Chinatown! Chinatown stuff! Thank you so much. A truly cosmopolitan port city. San Francisco has its eyes to the Far East, which, confusingly, lies to its Far West, across the great Pacific Ocean, from where many of its early immigrants came. The Chinese originally arrived here as coolie laborers to help build the railroads. They still keep together, giving San Francisco the oldest and best established Chinatown in America. Well, these are chocolate ones, these, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, okay. Oh. Big one, come on. Well, what? No, there's one. Yeah, I'd love to try one. Okay. Oh, the hot. Nice. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Really hot. <laughs> mm. Mm, good. good. What's yeah. my fortune? Fooling you says, dedicated bachelor is one who believes in adage of wine, women, and salon. <laughs> oh, it's a joke. At least, okay, thank kind you. of joke. Okay. There's your card, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Golden Gate Fortune Cookies yeah, Company. Golden, yeah. How long have you been doing this? Many years. 62, 46 years. 46 years. And are the fortunes always true? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Extraordinary that after 46 years, his English could still be quite so eccentric, which could also be said of this rendition of our blessed national anthem. But the Chinese always do things their own way, which I suspect is why they've been able so successfully to blend their culture with America's without losing their identity. Passing the now gentrified quayside, where the coolies, prospectors and snake oil salesmen once tumbled off their leaky boats, I head up to Knob Hill and am meeting with a more recent immigrant to this great city. Johnny Ive, Essex-born and Newcastle-trained, is the design guru for Apple. The MacBooks, iPods, iPhones and iMacs, they're all his babies. Not many cities can boast such a view, can they? It's all extraordinary, round. isn't it? And that's the famous prison island, isn't it? That's, that's Alcatraz. Which only Clint Eastwood ever escaped from. <laughs> Fabulous. It could be said that the two most influential Britons of the past 30 years are Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the World Wide Web, and you, who've given us the iPod and all the train of Apple products. Yet you both choose to live and work in America. I wonder if that says something about Britain, or more importantly, about America. I, I think that th th there's just a, a conspicuous lack of, of um, cynicism and, and, and scepticism. And, and I, ideas are so fragile, aren't they? Yeah. That, that they? It's so easy to sort of miss an idea um, because they can be so quiet or to snuff, snuff an idea out. I, I think that the sense of um, the inquisitiveness and the, the, the willingness to, to try um, is, is so important for, for, for design, for developing developing those tentative, fragile ideas into a real product. There's nothing fragile about an earlier design classic. The Golden Gate Bridge is the gateway to Northern California and my journey up the coast. I should be traveling into Oregon and onto Seattle in Washington State before heading far north to Alaska and finally journey's end in the far south on the islands of Hawaii. California has the seventh largest economy in the world, but it's not all high-tech and showbiz. Agribusiness is huge, and while wine may be the best known, it's estimated that the largest in pure dollar terms is weed. Mendocino County is the marijuana growing center of the nation, not least because under local law you're allowed to grow up to 99 pot plants for medicinal purposes. 
Sheriff Tom Allman is on the front line. Last year, we eradicated 344,000 marijuana plants. <laughs> we eradicate so much marijuana in the summertime, logistically, it's hard to get rid of. We had to buy last year a very large 12 uh, inch tree chipper. Oh, yes, I know the kind of thing. That we, uh, we chip marijuana up, and if it's on public lands, we'll just chip it and let it go into the woods for the wildlife to eat. So there are a lot of rather dazed birds flying into trees. And it gives a whole new like meaning to birds that are high. Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. Right. You want to see me strike here in Jimmy's heart? At the sheriff's compound, a crack team are preparing for a drug bust. But before I'm allowed to join them, I have a very special date with firearms supremo Greg Stefan. All right, Stephen, have you ever fired a handgun? I haven't. This is absolutely my first time. Really? Yeah, it really is. I've, well, I've been a rifle at school, but that's it. Well, I'm we're, lying on my stomach. We're honored that you're shooting a handgun here. I brought a Dirty Harry pistol for you. No, not oh, a Magnum. Yeah, absolutely. <gasps> That would be the greatest honor of my life. Right <laughs> That's the Dirty Harry revolver. Oh, my. A Smith & Wesson Model 29, 44 Magnum. <sighs> uh, this one's going to be a little bit easier to shoot than Dirty Harry's in that it has some extra weight in the barrel and the cylinder. Right. It's also a wonderful smell. Now, you know the old cowboys used yeah. to keep a $20 bill in one cylinder. Really? Because that would be their burial cost if they lost a gunfight. Oh, my. I know what you're thinking. Did I fire five shots or only six? Well, to tell you the truth, in all this excitement, I've kind of lost count myself. But being as this is a 44 Magnum, the most powerful handgun in the world, and can blow your head clean off, you've got to ask yourself a question. Oh! Ooh, hot. Do I feel lucky? Ah! Mummy! Well, punk, do you? <laughs> Holy mackerel! <laughs> oh! 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 You feel that, don't you? <laughs> oh! That scares the life out of me, that gun. You, oh. had, you had the movie lines up perfect till the last part. <laughs> Clint Eastwood did not say "Holy mackerel." He didn't. Did he? he just slightly narrowed his eyes. <laughs> It's big enough for my tummy. This is the absolute Latest. newest oh, is it? 2008 wonderful. model. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. We need to take care of you. Thank you. Goes in my trousers, which are appropriately brown. We're ready if you guys are. All right, pony up, and uh, it's going to go well. I'm following our heavily armed convoy to a remote farmhouse where it's believed a large illegal crop is ready to be harvested. We have arrived. And this is all based on intelligence from your undercover operatives, is it? It is. Okay, so the first units are on scene, and we have to knock on doors by law. We can't just bust in. Uh, you, even with a warrant, you have even to. Even with a warrant, you have to knock on the door. You have to serve it physically, do you? Uh, yeah, there's about a 10-second time frame. You have to announce your presence. Right. And then if, they, if the door doesn't open and you don't hear people saying, just a minute. Yeah then you can go ahead and force your entry. Right. But forcing your entry sometimes means turning the doorknob and opening the door. Uh, right, it's as simple as that. So now they're announcing, come on out, you can get out now. So they've made some arrests, I think, do you think? Sounds like it. They, yeah. when, they, when we first pulled up on the radio, I heard them say they had players inside. Oh, players is what, is what the players word you being use for that, yeah. Crook. Right. We got what we came for. Which it was is all what? exactly as the intelligence predicted. Yeah. Yeah. We have two grow rooms in here that are full of plants, and there's another grow room up there. Apparently, there's two people that were in the house that are in custody right now. Okay. We'll get you the names later. They were pretty quiet, and they didn't resist arrest or anything. No, we don't have any resisting at all. No, <laughs> we're good. You look pretty formidable. I don't think I'd resist you. I have to say. <laughs> Yeah. That's great. So a good result. Yeah. So, Stephen, if you assume that marijuana is $25,000, $3,000 a pound, oh. and that each plant can produce two pounds, we're going to see what kind of finished product these oh people would have. Oh, goodness me. <laughs> oh, the smell. So we have another room to our right. Yeah. They look like they're a little smaller. And then we have these. And what they're, look, what they're trying to get is they're trying to get the perfect bud, yeah. uh, the THC content. The yeah. active constituent. Yeah. Nah, it's going to be on your hands all day. Whoa. Holy. 
That's a, it's, it's an oil, isn't it? It's like an it oil is. almost. It is. Whoa. That's very strong. So these are all female plants. Oh. And it's just like life. The females have no use for males whatsoever. <laughs> these people surely can't... Uh, make a claim in court that they're growing this for medicinal reasons. They would even, have to be very Even safe. if they bribed a doctor to give them a... Surely that this is clearly a commercial operation that's nothing to do with... This is clearly a commercial operation. Yeah. I've suggested to our elected board of supervisors that if it's going to be legalized as medical marijuana, that we, the sheriff's office, sell these plastic zip ties that would have serial numbers on them, yeah. And they would go on the base of each marijuana plant, and we could identify that plant as being legitimately medical, nice. okay. and we would be able to get some money from it. I can't stand Leaving the heady aroma of Mendocino, I drive north to the infamously laid-back campus of Humboldt University, where I want to find out what's cooking with a new generation of the counterculture, from student siren Carmen King. If you've never been here before, it is an all-women open mic. Only vaginas welcome on stage. Sorry if you have a penis, you are welcome to be in the audience, but you cannot perform on stage unless in full drag. What we do that's a little different is we don't have a sign-up list. We think lists are too hierarchical, so we have a, a love bubble sheet. Thank you, Melody. So if you want to play, just come up. We'll give you a love bubble, and when, you, and when you're ready, we'll just pop your bubble. <laughs> Great. Well, I'm going to play another song. Kind of goes with the last one about a bitch named Brooklyn. She's got eyes and black and a sexy backpack. She drives a big ugly truck, but I don't give a fuck. She's got sex, curly hair, wearing boys underwear. She's got golden tan skin. Please let me in. Let's have some fun, some fun. Some dirty girly fun. You know what I'm talking about. Don't have to be the only one. Invite some friends and have some fun. You're a smoker of the weed, are you? I've, I've, I've smoked weed in my time. I have. Yeah. I smoked my fair share. So is this quite a weed-smoking college, then? I've heard a statistic that only 53% of the students smoke weed, but I think... Only 53? Oh, I mean, I think... <laughs> what would your mummies and daddies say? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of their mommies and daddies smoke, too, especially right. if they're from around here. Do you believe it should be legal? Um, I do, actually. The city of Denver, I don't know if you guys have gone there, they did the Alcohol Marijuana Equalization Act. Yeah. And so, I mean, they just brought up the point that 20,000 people die um, alcohol-related deaths in the U.S. every year, and there's none from marijuana. You're about to graduate, are you? I am. I'm going to graduate in one month. Well, my specialty is energy efficiency. I came, actually, to study environmental science, but it was just... That's ridiculous. It was just a bunch of hippies bitching and complaining about everything. Oh, this is wrong, this is wrong. And nobody ever talked about how to fix it you know, what to actually do, and I call myself a practical idealist. I mean, I'm not running around hugging trees and sitting in them trying to get them to, you know, not be cut down. I use paper, I live in a wood house, I understand that the economy must go on, but um, the economy is not going to go on if we keep using energy the way that we do. California is the only place where the trees literally hug you, so it's little wonder that this is where tree huggers, tree sitters, eco-warriors and earth firsters started their environmental campaigns. The Pacific Northwest has amongst the most ancient woodlands in North America. Some of the sequoias, the giant redwoods, are over a thousand years old. For the past 40 years, loggers have been at loggerheads with the Greens, for whom the preservation of the forests has become the clarion call for saving the planet. The pristine Rogue River Forest in Oregon is one of the key battlegrounds, and I'm traveling down the river with two arboreal advocates, Nate and Laura. They're taking me to a remote part of the forest to try and track down the red tree vole on which the spotted owl feeds. Now, this owl is an endangered species, and as such, under federal law, its habitat must be protected. So, if they can find a tree with evidence of red vole habitation, then an area of 10 kilometers around will be, by law, protected from logging. So, the vole's the thing to catch the conscience of the king. This is the kind of tree that would have the, the red tree vole that you've been telling me about. Yep, yeah. this is the one it would be in. Um, with, the, with the big fat branches they like and then the broken top that they can get down in, the little crevices and stuff. And they the, live their whole lives up there? Mm -hmm. They're born up there, they the breed females, up there? The females will stay up there their entire, their entire lives and breed and have babies. The males, however, come up yeah. and they 
you know, have a little visit, and then they go on to some other lady. Oh, they're a little man, about town. honestly. <laughs> I wish I could be going with you. It's just that I have this awful... It's a real nuisance. I have this awful cowardice. <laughs> it's just come over me. So, oh, can you imagine when I woke up this morning and I felt all cowardly, how annoyed I was. <laughs> Got it. Is it coming down? The other, oh, it's bouncing yep. around. Okay, send it down. It's coming down in between them. Oh, yeah. there we go. There we go. Okay. You want to test it? Yeah, you want to jump? Yeah. Let me um, come closer come, over. Come back. Save here. me. Okay, so Aww. the way we test it is if you can put two people's weight on it, you know it'll work. Then yep. it's gonna so, be good to go. So put it between your legs. Okay. So what we do? You got it. Go like this, and so. See that? Watch yep. your head. That's why you test it. Yep. And bits, so the, bits do come down. Yep. Yeah. So now I he'll lost go a little up bit again. of elevation. But yeah. but the actual limb obviously didn't oh, snap. Oh yeah. See that big nope. one. Because it's a huge branch. But better to have it break before you go up than when you're, than when you're up there, because yeah. that makes you nervous. Are you good to go? Yep, we're ready to go. Incredible. The Douglas fir bark has all these little, like, prickly things, like little splinters, where if you hug it, you don't want to hug this tree because it'll put little pricklies in your really? arms. Really? <laughs> That's not very It's friendly. not a tree you want to hug. What's your view of the sort of tree-hugging classes and the people who stay on trees to stop the... Developers or the loggers. And... Oh, I was one of them. Oh, were you? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, so you're a big supporter. That's where I met Nate. Was out at a, a tree sit, but um, I definitely support it. But I think you know you gotta. There's all sorts of different tools you need in your toolbox. You check that branch. Um, I haven't gotten there yet. Hang on a sec. Oh. You get a little higher. <laughs> I haven't checked the first there's branch. No time for a domestic spat. <laughs> it know. looks like there's a nest <laughs> in it. I see branch clippings sticking out. Oh, you see branch. Ah. Oh! Yeah. Don't look At least up. you both wear glasses. <laughs> yeah. There's a nest right here on this branch. A bull nest? Oh, you yeah. found one. Yeah. There's one inside this dead branch. Are you getting a sample, Nate? Uh, I'm getting a picture. Hooray! Yeah, it's in, this whole branch here is hollow. And it's just full of bull stuff. Would that photograph constitute proof? No, or? they'd have to have one of their climbers come up and look at it. Oh, I see. Because the nest material and the fecal matter they leave in there is specific to the vole. And so we just take a pinch out and put it in a little plastic baggie, and then we use a GPS unit to mark where the tree is. Goodness and then submit me. all that. Do you want to pinch a sample? Yeah, I'll do that. Can you save some fecal matter for me? I'll bring you down a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> it smells piney fresh. <laughs> That the forests still stretch for hundreds of miles is in large part due to the activities of people like Nate and Laura. And it is in this vast hinterland of Oregon that a creature even more endangered than the spotted owl is reputed to live. Well, according to Matt Johnson. We want to prove the existence of the animal officially and therefore get it listed on the endangered species list and protect its habitat. Right. Tell me how you know that he does exist. Well, my family and I, we went through the Oregon Caves and then we decided to hike the Big Tree Loop Trail. So we were about a mile up the mountain around 5 p.m. or so. Yeah. And um, we started um, smelling something coming down wind down the hill. And then we hear this noise as we walk, um, very deep bass, guttural, mammal, and much louder and more bass than I can do right now, but it, it went, whoa, 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 whoa. And we're like, we stop, it stops. And we're looking at each other like, what is that? We walk again, it, whoa, whoa, whoa. We keep going. We eventually get to a point where, um, Mother Nature is knocking on my door. So I have to, <laughs> right. yeah, okay. I, I have to <laughs> hike up the hill through the brush, probably about a good 60, 80 feet away from my family. And I'm behind some brush and trees doing my thing. Then all of a sudden, out of the left corner of my eye, I saw something move and I turned my head and I looked down and that's when I saw Bigfoot walk off the pages of myth and legend into reality. You know, I, I had some people afterwards say, well, why didn't you stop and take pictures? And it's like, <laughs> I have my family there, yeah. and I'm not going to stop and take pictures and risk 
losing my family. So you're talking about a hairy primate. We're talking about <clears throat> we're talking about a very tall hairy primate that walked upright like a human being. After we got off the mountain, we made a report to the park headquarters. And he said, you need to know that the park has a policy where we will not publicly acknowledge the presence of a Sasquatch. What is it that they're trying to hide, do you think? <clears throat> all, all I'm going to say, and it's just a guess, is that you saw what happened over 30 years ago when they declared the spotted owl an endangered species. Yeah. It locked up a whole lot of timberland, shut down a whole lot of logging companies and towns, and the state of Oregon is still recovering from that 40 years later, yes. economically. Now, can you imagine what would happen if you identified a seven to nine foot primate species living in these mountains? How much land that would lock up? That's what right. kind of economic devastation that would um, create for the entire Pacific Northwest, Northern California. Personally, I think its existence is about as likely as me playing in a cup final. But Matt is certainly convinced, and if more of this extraordinary ancient woodland can be preserved, so much the better. Heading up the Oregon coast into Washington state, and the raw energy of the Pacific Ocean is ever present. It's a different but equally invigorating energy that awaits me in the eclectic city of Seattle. Seattle is a more urbane version of Liverpool, energy, wit, and a center for new music. At Pike Place Market, I meet up with Christoph Snell. He owns Seattle's Can Can Cabaret Club and is a bringer-on of young talent who relishes the edginess and creativity of this major Pacific port. Oh, well, this, you see, I mean, this is fabulous. It really is. I mean, not many European markets can compete with this, actually. Fresh fish off the boat, baked goods they bake right here in the market. Ah, yeah. oh, right Look off the queue. That. Whoa, that's... Oh! <laughs> into an art form. Oh, oh. yes! <laughs> there it is! Oh, it's been a wonderful idea. Oh, that's so soft. Steam. <laughs> Melt in your mouth, aren't they? The oh, ones? my lord. <laughs> oh, they are. Oh. Seattle, of course, has got a reputation as, well, 15 years ago, it was the center of the musical universe, wasn't yeah, it? Absolutely. That wonderful word, grunge. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but is it still a, a place of lively music? Yeah, absolutely. The music scene, you know, we're in the heart of it. We're, it's great because we get to see the, the beginnings of the music. Yeah. So when someone is starting out, they're playing at our club. Ladies and gentlemen, she just turned 15 years old! Please put your hands together and give a warm round of applause for Hannah Weeks! The suicide rate in Seattle is very high, isn't it? It's very high, as is, uh, you know, the heroin use, and so these these kind of... Uh, so, <clears throat> despite the fact that it's a, a vibrant and wonderful place, it's also a place where kids are very disaffected and alienated. Absolutely. Is that also because it has maybe three of the most famous businesses in America? You've got, uh, you've got Microsoft. Right. Uh, you've got Boeing. Right. Uh, who make all the aeroplanes and the jumbo jets that, that aren't made by Eurobus. <laughs> And you've got um, Starbucks. I mean, they're, they're three very, very famous world brands, and maybe the kids are all—are they all kids of executives or something? Is—is is that why they all commit suicide? Because they've got hideous corporate parents. Exactly. <laughs> the, the weather adds a huge part in it. I think you know. It also uh, there's a certain melancholy state that I think is conducive to creating art. <laughs> Put your lips at my command right now. 
The Pacific Ocean defines Seattle, and while its weather may contribute to its citizens' overall melancholy, the sea breeze certainly helps with a hangover. A stone's throw from the Can Can, I have a rendezvous with some aquatic denizens of the city, Carol, CJ, and Barney, who has a personal hygiene problem. He has his own toothbrush, but, Mark Barney. Oh, an electric yes. toothbrush. Uh-huh, a you Sonicare. lucky fellow. Yeah, nothing but the best. Now, if we don't do this, he'll get gingivitis. Harbor seals in the wild have been found with gingivitis, I, I was too. just going to say, mm -hmm. in the wild, they obviously don't have this regime. No. Even with manual toothbrushes in the wild. No, there's hardly any of that. No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, they really are like dogs in some ways, aren't they, those faces? They're very trainable. They right. bark and they have pups. No, they don't bark. Don't they? They will make a growling noise at night. Well, that we don't of... really <clears throat> know what... No, kind of no. like... Ooh, yeah, really? kind of like that. Okay. Yeah. How old is he? Barney's 22. Really? So he's an old guy. But probably in the wild, we don't really think they probably live that long. It's just they're so protected from predators and bad food here. And yeah. like a lot of old people, he's decided to take fish oil supplements. Yeah. <laughs> All his life. And look what he's yeah, it's clearly That's very right. good. Okay, get in the water. You gotta start there. Okay, ready? Get it! Yeah. yeah, sometimes we get a little wet. Yeah, yeah that's fair enough. CJ has another treat in store for me. These are our northern or Alaskan sea otters. They tend to spend a lot of their time in kelp forests, uh, diving up to 200 feet or more. Um, and then they have loose pockets of skin right underneath their arms, and they'll stuff those like a kangaroo almost. Good lord. Full of food, and then bring it to the surface and use their... Their tummies as a dining table, so... Um, yeah, I've noticed the swooping backwards is charming. Used a little food coloring to bring out the patriotic <laughs> aspect <laughs> of it. That's beautifully but... done. There you there are. We go. We'll see. Woohoo! That's a new oh. one for you. I think <laughs> he stood to attention, that? you know. Oh, right for the, he's got, the red stripe. He's got the fish straight away. Now, he's greedy. He's got the... <laughs> He's got the Union Jack and the ball of time. <laughs> they eat up to 25% of their body weight a day. Yeah, your own body weight in quarter pounders, oh that number. Goodness. Isn't that amazing? This Washington is the 48th of what they call the contiguous states, the states that adjoin each other on the continental landmass. Only two more to go now, Alaska and Hawaii. And I'm afraid there's no room for our cab in the snowy wastes of Alaska or across the Pacific. So this is where we say goodbye. Alaska is Kodiak Island, the second biggest island in the US. State number 49, Alaska. And what a state. The largest in America by far, it's over three times as big as France and 13 times the size of England. What many people don't realize about Alaska is that for much of its recent history, it was owned by Russia, not America. The United States paid the princely sum of $7.2 million for it back in the 19th century. That was two cents an acre. There are actually signs of that Russian ancestry all around in the names of the roads and particularly in the methods of worship that are still practiced in this community to this very day. The Russians first came to Alaska as their empire expanded eastwards under Tsar Peter the Great. After Vetus Bering's expedition of 1742, sea otter pelts, which are the warmest of any fur, became a major source of revenue. 
Realising how efficient the native Alawit peoples were at hunting, they were effectively enslaved by the Russian merchants, and both otters and the Alawits were to be driven to the brink of extinction. With the merchants came the Russian Orthodox Church, which in 1794 set up this mission in Kodiak. Some missionary churches were not welcomed by the local people. W was yours? Missionaries originally came to uh, minister to the Russian fur traders that were here when uh, they first landed. Oh, here so in not to convert. Island. Right, right. right. They, 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 but it changed very, very quickly, almost immediately, uh, when, the, when the missionaries, led by St. Herman, saw that, in fact, the, many of the native, local native folks were being um, enslaved and treated poorly mm. by, the, by the Russian fur traders. And that, that allowed them to begin to minister to the native communities, which led to the church becoming indigenous very, very quickly. It's estimated that over a million of these delightful sea otters were hunted for their fur. Today, their numbers have recovered, although they're still endangered. I'm eager to see them in the wild, and Lee Robinson, a local fisherman, takes me to the far side of the island, where he says he sometimes sees rafts of up to a hundred of them. I'm astonished by how beautiful the massacre is. I... I've been saving up the knowledge that I've been coming here and thinking of wintry wastes, you know, kind of ghastly cold winds, and, but you're not prepared for how... It's a very subtle and extraordinary kind of beauty, isn't it? Yes, it is. What is it about this kind of living that, that you like, or do you think you're an unusual person? You, you don't um, like the human race? Or... I think... I think uh, I'm not an unusual. I think uh, most men that live in Alaska want to do this same thing. So this it gets is, into your soul, does it? Yes. I mean, it's, this is the only, I'm only being blessed because I was able to find the land and I got a great wife that will live in the wilderness, yeah. you yeah. know, live out here with me. So what's your attitude towards the rest of the United States of America? What, how do you refer to it? As the, do you call it the mainland? Uh, lower 48. The lower 48? 48, 48, yeah. <laughs> is that contemptuous? Oh, I don't know. That's, that's what we call it, the lower 48, you know, we're, yeah. we're, we're up north, they're down in the lower 48. That's true. So yeah. what have we got here? Is this bait? Yeah, this is bait. We, uh, this is herring. All I've right. uh, cut it and salted it. And then we've got a, a jig there oh, uh, this with a single like a, like a little squid. A little if, plastic uh, squid. If the bait falls off, uh, we still got the squid. That's clever. The one thing I don't have on here is hot running water. You've just wiped your hands in freezing seawater. Well, I suppose it's better than having them fishy. Yeah, smell yeah. them. <laughs> yep, you know what, charming. Okay, mm. hang on here a minute. We're going to move over to our spot. Oh, okay. Hello, yeah, fishing. Hello, and halibut. Just for the halibut. Just for the halibut. How big can a halibut get? Um, I think the record sport caught is out in uh, Dutch Harbor. It's real close to 500 pounds. Good gracious yeah. for me. Get me out here. I miss my cabin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I can. I'm sure I can feel something. How do I read it in? I just, just spin that. I put it up. Yeah, yeah. Bring it in. Oh. See what we got oh, here. Oh, there's definitely resist. Oh. oh, I can see it. What is it? Oh, it's an Irish lord. Has it any idea how ugly it is? Yeah, I think oh. it does. Here, go ahead. What is the beast? Me. Surely you can't eat that. Oh, sorry. Oh, is that edible? Um, I usually don't eat them. <laughs> so he lives in the deep? Yeah. I yeah. found that, generally speaking, the fish, that, the lower down they are... The uglier they yeah, are? Because they don't need to be pretty. Because <laughs> Look at <laughs> what are you? You silly thing. <laughs> oh, an Irish... Irish lord. They've got a few mechanisms here that really kind of hurt. Like yes, these are a lot of spikes, spikes going on. See, these are spines. Oh, so it's quite... Uh, oh, yeah, if you get those stuck on you, they'll, uh, they're really uh, kind of poisonous. Goodbye, Irish Lord. Um, God bless you. Yeah. There he, oh, goes. there he goes. Leaving my lucky Lord and happy Lee behind, I'm heading north a thousand miles to Barrow. Perched on the Chukchi Sea area of the Arctic Ocean, it's almost entirely inhabited by an Inuit people called the Inupiat.
I've come as far north on my journey as I can. In fact, I've come to the farthest north city in all of America. It's called Barrow. It's more of a village, really. It's right within the Arctic Circle. And behind me, the sea is frozen. This looks like a desolate place. It's certainly as far north as I've ever been or would ever want to go, and as cold as I've ever been or would ever want to be. But despite appearances, this is a very exciting time of year for Barrow because the sea is actually breaking up, and that means a great deal round here. Henry Kinyak is captain of one of Barrow's whaling boats that are allowed by international law to hunt the bowhead and beluga whales that cruise these Arctic seas. Inupiat people are entitled to hunt for whales, but no one else is in this area, is that right? I think um, 10 communities that can wear. Right. Yeah. And how many are you allowed to capture in one year? Um, in one year, we can. We, they gave us 22 strikes. So it's not as if you are slaughtering huge pods of whales, no. are you? We're not, we, we don't call it slaughtering, we're, we're, we're feeding the community. Yes, You right. know, to me, I, 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 I thought that my mom and my dad breaded me for hunting. Yeah. When we're whaling, this is what we use. Oh my goodness. It's a whale gun. A whale gun? Is that, and, oh, and it's, it's so heavy. It weighs about 60 pounds. 60 pounds. There's a propellant charge that's a uh, jiggeruk. What's a jiggeruk anyway? Oh. Primer, like a oh, primer. Oh, I see. And then from there, then you got the, the shell is about this big. Oh, my goodness. What's the best part of a whale? What's the... Everything is the You best. love it all? Yeah. yeah. There's different ways that you can eat it. You could eat it raw, frozen. Yeah. You could cook it. You could ferment it. Really? And, yeah, you, the, the fermenting is... Um, Mikiak, yeah. that's what they call it. Mikiak. And you let it age for about a week. All my kids love it, and me, yeah. and the whole family. It is getting kind of warm because this time of the year, it would be really, really cold. Oh, really? You don't call this cold, then? No. <laughs> it's, to us, it's, it's kind of warm. 20 past 8 in the evening. Yeah. And, and the, the sun is still out. And how long will it stay light for? Right now, it stays nice and bright until October. Good Lord. And it stays bright all through the night? Yeah. So it never sets? Yeah. If it's the winter, when of course there's no sun at all, do you ever go out? You don't? Yeah. You do? Yeah. We, do we, you... Have to, we have to go out. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter if it's day or night, you know. We, we go caribou hunting at in the, in the winter, and it, sometimes it gets dark. And do you find your way by the stars, though? Yeah, stars or GPS. <laughs> Modern technology. <laughs> Henry, what, one thing that Alaska is becoming famous for also is oil and gas. The oil company's been coming up here, trying, you know, talking to the whaling captains and the community, and they want to try to drill here on the ocean. Really? I, I say no to it, because yeah. this is our food. This is our livelihood right here. Yeah. If, if something happened and uh, the oil, oil rig or something breaks down and oil starts coming, yeah. it, it would contaminate our food. Yes. Our garden. Yes, your garden. Yeah. That's yeah. a very good way of putting it. A cold, wet garden. The wind changes direction and threatens to break up the frozen sea. The fragile sealskin boats are easily crushed by breaking ice. Thoughts of finding a bowhead whale are shelved for the time being as everyone scrambles to get back to land. Right now, this is not a good time to try to harvest the whale in this condition because of the yeah. the west wind and the currents are changing. I can see the white yeah, on the, on the horizon. It's kicking up waves, isn't it? Yeah. And the flocks of birds are coming in here. They call them eider ducks. Eider ducks? Yeah. Oh, famous for their feathers, making um, good quilts. Oh, yeah. They're yeah. Good. Eider duck. They're real good eating, too. Are they? <laughs> yeah. They're the best. <laughs> Maybe not all the way. When we harvest that well, we uh, work all night. 
It takes about 24 hours wow. by the time we're done with the whole whale. How do you hide the smell from the bears? Because they have an amazing sense of smell. Well, that's the thing. We can. So they, they, they come to the area where we're butchering and we give them a warning. Really? You give them a warning shot, and if you don't acknowledge it, we shoot them right there to protect the rest of the people. Yeah. That's how dangerous they are. They're supernatural beings. Just one blow, he can crush your skull. Boy. Just like how they do it with the seals. Yeah. One blow. That's all it takes. Yeah. So what do you do if you don't have a rifle? Well, you hightail and run. <laughs> <laughs> on the snow machine or literally with your legs? Well, on a snow machine and boat. Yeah. Sometimes we got chased before. There will be no whales today. But over the three-month season, the Inupiaq will harvest their allotted 22 bowheads, enough to tide them over the long winter. Well, if I seem a little inappropriately dressed for the Arctic Circle, it's because I'm saying farewell to Barrow, northernmost city of the United States, and I'm going to say hello to the southernmost part of the United States. I'm on my way to Hawaii, which is apparently 3,450 miles in that direction. famed Waikiki Beach on the island of Oahu, I ingeniously disguise myself as an absurdly dressed, overweight tourist for a meeting with Terry Pennington, a private there investigator. There notably dark side to paradise here? Well, I, I guess there is, like there is in any um, U.S. city. Yeah. There's an element of crime and drugs and prostitution and government corruption. Really? Um, we do a fair amount of criminal defense work. Are they often innocent, or can't you tell me that? <laughs> I would have to say more often than not, they uh, have actually participated in, in some degree or another. <laughs> but you might be able to reduce the sentence. Right, right. <laughs> and they have a right to a fair trial, and, and we do our bit. <laughs> I guess for me, the, the reward, or what I enjoy in the job, is helping people. Yeah. You know, I suppose, if I was to imagine trying to do your job, the thing one would most find pleasure in would be finding a missing person for a family. Right. Is right. that something you've done? Many times, many times. Really? We found uh, a homeless guy from the mainland who was actually an heir to a, a multi-million dollar fortune. You're kidding me. And he, $15 million had been put in trust for this, this kid, but he couldn't handle the money. He would end up using it on drugs and alcohol. So are, are there many down and outs in Hawaii? Um, you know, like any city, there's, there's a fair amount. I think uh, what attracts more to Hawaii is the warm climate. I mean, the beautiful scenery. You can essentially live on the beach here. But you need the money to jet over here. Well, you do. And uh, at times in the past, we've discovered that uh, different governments, municipalities on the mainland, to get rid of their homeless problem, were actually sticking a plane ticket in homeless <laughs> people's hands. Go to and dropping them off at the airport. Go to Hawaii, but don't, Hawaii. don't sit on the right. sidewalk selling false watches. It's a one-way <laughs> ticket. Yes. So, well, that, that could be worse. It could be worse. On the other side of the island from Waikiki, the North Shore has a more relaxed ethos. But there's no relaxing for me. Well, this is a first for me. I've never swum with sharks before. I've been in a boardroom full of television executives, which is not that far off. You don't throw them fish, though. Hobnobs, yes, but not fish. I may try that in the future, if it works. So wish me luck. I am, I have to confess, just a little nervous. Don't be nervous. You're good. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank Take you, a Joe. deep breath. Joe Pavsek, an XPI and friend of Terry, has been running shark tours for over a decade. He says these Galapagos sharks are docile. Docile? They eat seals even bigger and blubberier than me, for goodness sake. Uh, uh, uh. Say goodbye to the people. There we are. Goodbye, everybody. Uh, 
Right. It's been nice being your host for how many so, years? Yeah, quite. <laughs> Not very good with snorkels either. I tend to drown. Well, <laughs> sort of gulp. Okay. That's a dry snorkel, so you won't get water in it. Good then. Okay. Just float it to the other side. Keep to the back and grab onto a bar. <laughs> Mm. Mm. That's right. That's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, there are sharks. There are sharks there. Believe me. Absolutely. I have to say, it's not frightening at all. It's just beautiful. They're wonderful animals. Really wonderful. Right. Joe, when did you first come to Hawaii? I moved here in 1969 from San Diego area. In 1969? Mm -hmm. I'm only 27. <laughs> in 1969, I, I guess it was a lot less developed. She's on the south side of, of Oahu. Especially on the south. Yes. Yeah. There's, there's so much development that's gone on over there. It's kind of an <laughs> island divided into two, isn't it? The, the, the North Shore and South Shore. Yeah, and we're on the North Shore, and you're a North Shore kind of a guy, yeah? Well, it's the country. Yeah. In fact, I'm wearing this T-shirt. Yep. Um, defend Oahu, and it's all about the country yes. on the back, it says. Um, because it's constantly under threat for the kind of development that's ruined well, Waikiki, is it? since we've lost our sugar cane and pineapple, all the developers eyeballing all this land. Look at right there. You can see everything would be ocean view. Yeah, it's so beautiful. So do you think you've got a chance, though, to, of sticking it and keeping, keeping this place free from development? <laughs> no. Really? Have you seen anywhere that's been free from development? I think, alas, Joe is not being unduly pessimistic. It's the curse of tourism to destroy what it most desires. Hawaii survives on tourism and with good reason. Its 19 islands, the tips of a mighty chain of volcanic mountains, are all staggeringly beautiful and surprisingly different. A short but incredibly scary flight from Oahu, and I'm approaching the dramatic coast of Kauai, the oldest of the islands and to many the most Polynesian of them all. Titus Kinimaka is a native of Kauai and a celebrated champion surfer and mean plucker of the ukulele. Just heaven. It's really a, a special place. Kauai is uh, very special. And in Hawaii, it's the oldest island, the first island out of the sea. This island has been uh, populated by Hawaiians for, you know, thousands of years. You're also part of America. Yeah, we've become very uh, civilized. Do you, <laughs> do you feel American? If, if someone asked you what uh, your nationality was, would you, would you say American? Um, I am Hawaiian, yeah, and I will always be Hawaiian. And uh, my family, I, I can trace back my family about uh, 500 years. Really? Yeah. So that's before... And our that's... family's from Kauai. 
That's before the British, um, which I notice is still in the Hawaiian flag, yeah. Captain Cook, <laughs> before he arrived. Yeah, Captain Cook, he was probably one that started it all, yeah? <laughs> yes, I apologise for that. Yes. And then, no, you know, it wasn't... Bad. After him, it was Thomas Cook, with exactly. the holiday man. So. But, you know, um, you know, they came over here, and they're... Mm. I believe in timing, you know? Yeah. Mm. yeah. I guess they had bad timing, because... He yes. ended up in the pot. He did, didn't he? Yeah, he was because uh, the first yeah. time he came, he was welcomed. Yeah. The second time, eaten. Yeah. <laughs> but the cooking of Cook didn't deter the tourists for long. All around the world, you see oh. local people who are caught in the fact that tourism does bring in instant cash and therefore is very tempting. On the other hand, it completely changes the very thing that that is special to them and to the rest of the world. And exactly, and which is you know the values that we should all as um, Hawaiians hang on to because as soon as uh, there's a hurricane here in Hawaii mm. everybody's gone everybody who supposedly lives here on Kauai goes back home to wherever they come from right, right? so they got another house somewhere else but you know we're still here and so yeah. do you resent that because obviously rich people will no, always look for the most beautiful place I don't resent that I don't resent that place. I just, I just uh, um, like to make it clear that I know that Mm. You know, when storms come, everybody else has a place to go. It's the definition of a fair weather friend. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Titus inveigles me to join up with some of his family for a quick paddle to his home on one of the most stunning beaches I've ever been to. It's quite hard to resist humming the theme tune from Hawaii Five Hour, which every, everybody does, of course. It's a terrible cliche, but it's hard to resist. <laughs> no, that's it. That's what everybody can relate to. Yeah. In the, in the world, it's the Hawaii Five Hour and the canoe paddling, and yeah, you're actually doing it. <laughs> that's it. I never thought the day would come. Oh. 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 <laughs> I like that. Thank you for that. A hike and a paddle. A hike and a paddle, what a day. A hike and a paddle. Full day. What a day I've had. Polynesian hospitality requires Titus to prepare a traditional hula. That means singing, dancing, and the obligatory piglet. It's not like you go to the office every day. This actually is your life. This is, this is how people live. Yeah. With music and food. This is magic. Look at this. Look at this. It sometimes so gets I, as cold as 72 degrees, doesn't it? Ooh. Oh, it's bad. Yeah. It gets chilly, man. I, I'll have to put a long sleeve shirt on. <laughs> a long sleeve yeah. shirt? Well, there, you see, now that's the reason I have to leave. I can't possibly yeah. live in a place where I'd have to wear a long sleeve shirt. You know, it's, it's hard. Mm. But we try to endure. <laughs> you lucky swine. <laughs> and talking of swine, can we have yeah, some more of this? Speaking of. <laughs> oh, this is wonderful. Big Island is, as its name suggests, the biggest island of the archipelago, and it's also the most recent. The tallest of its five volcanoes, Mauna Kea, rises 14,000 feet above sea level. High above the clouds and the distorting effects of the Earth's atmosphere, it is one of the very best places on the planet from which to observe the heavens. The Keck Observatory has the largest optical telescope in the world. Its stereoscopic lens allows it to probe deep into space to the very origins of the universe, which is why astrophysicist Alex Filipenko loves the place so much that he even got married here. Let me show you the most powerful explosion we've ever found. Oh, yes, please. Wow. Okay. Oh, my. This is a fabulous one. Watch the star. Before it exploded, oh, it actually had oh. a double ejection like this. This was not the end of its life. That was a, an explosion before the end. There the, there's the explosion at the end. So those two sort of, like, bags of... What are they? They're, they're, they're lobes of debris. Lobes, that's a good word. Yeah, yes, double so lobes. Double that lobes. This, that this star ejected maybe 10 or 20 years before its colossal death. Oh so there was this relatively gentle ejection. You, yeah. That's relatively yeah. gentle. Wouldn't want to be and in the middle And then a colossal it. explosion. Just bam, yeah. right? Not only are they billions of times more powerful than the sun, 
but they're crucial for life as we know it. Did you realize that the heavy elements of which you are made, the yeah. carbon in your cells, the calcium in your bones, the oxygen that you breathe, the iron in your red blood cells, all of those elements were cooked up in the nuclear furnaces deep inside stars and then blown out into the cosmos by these colossal explosions. Brilliant. So you, as Carl Sagan used to say, are made of star stuff. Are you an optimist about man's place in the universe? Do you think we'll screw it up before we get a chance to save it? Or do you think we'll oh, save it Stephen, before we screw that's, it? that's the million dollar question. Yeah. You know, one depressing possibility that explains why we haven't found any clear signals from any extraterrestrials is that something that comes along with higher intelligence is this self-destructive ability. Yeah. So what if civilizations out there, the intelligent ones, just go flash in the night? They don't last long enough to explore the rest of our Milky well, Way galaxy. Maybe cultures and societies are like the systems you discovered, that they, yeah. they have their supernovas too. Well, I'm hoping that, the, that humans will overcome their difficulties and will last a very, very long time and will someday go out and populate yeah planetary systems around other stars. I leave Alex and his wonderful and very American sense of optimism for a flight over the lava fields that are still spewing forth molten rock that cools to form new land. Wow, that's extraordinary. Nature's furnace. You can see why people used to believe in hell. It looks like the entrance to the underworld, doesn't it? And you'll have to take my word for it, you can actually feel the heat from up here. I've never seen anything like that in my life. Well, here my journey has to end because here America ends, this is as far south as you can get in the whole United States. Actually, you know, America doesn't end here because, because new America is being made all the time by these extraordinary volcanic forces. In fact, in the last six weeks, a whole 20 acres of new America was made. It's a country that's constantly being reborn. Looking down on the geological melting pot of America, I think back over the weeks of this astonishing journey through 50 states of being. United or not, a force for good or ill, they make up the United States of America, a land of matchless variety, beauty, energy, and life. You can read more about Stephen Fry's discoveries on his journey across America in this book which accompanies the series. Match of the Day 2 over on BBC Two Now, featuring Everton against Middlesbrough and Manchester City's trip to Hull.